Hello, I'm Jamila Musaeva, an international social etiquette consultant and the author of the book Etiquette, the least you need to know. Today's video is very different from everything that I've done before, but this video is the most personal and dear to me. Today, I want to tell you about my country. A lot of you have been asking me about my origin in the comment section. And today I want to tell to everyone that I am from Azerbaijan and I'm proud of it. Some of you may have heard about my country or even visited Azerbaijan, but a lot of you probably have been hearing about it lately in the news. I understand you are influenced by what you hear and the media outlets and the way they represent the story. But today I want to share my side of story. Today I want to tell you the facts that you need to know when listening to those media outlets. First and foremost, I want to share with you some interesting information about my country. Azerbaijan, also known as the land of fire, is located in Eurasia. Though the majority of the population in Azerbaijan is predominantly Muslim, the country prides itself on multiculturalism and tolerance, with various ethnic groups such as Avars, Lesgians, and Talish people and others living together peacefully. Azerbaijan was the world's leading oil producer in the 19th and 20th century and in fact the founders of Nobel Prize, the Nobel Brothers, founded their company in Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, and made majority of their wealth right here in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is known not only for the oil, but also for its climatic regions. To be more specific, the country has 9 out of the possible 12 climatic regions. Azerbaijan, a democratic republic which existed from 1918 to 1920, right before becoming part of the Soviet Union, was the first country in the Muslim world to grant women the right to vote. In 1918, this is prior the US and long before France granted its female citizens the right to vote. An amalgam of East and West, Azerbaijan is known as the Pearl of Caucasus. So now let's address the most important question that has been appearing in the media lately. What is going on between Azerbaijan and Armenia? And to answer it, Azerbaijan is fighting a war to free its occupied territories, to be precise, the Nagorno Karabakh from Armenia. So let's start from the very beginning. Nagorno Karabakh is a territory of Azerbaijan that was inhabited by both Azerbaijani and Armenian people in the times of the Soviet Union. With the fall of the Soviet Union in the early 90s, Armenia seized this land from Azerbaijan, therefore expelling and killing thousands of Azerbaijani people from their homeland. To be more specific, as a result of this seizure, there has been over 500,000 internally displaced people in Azerbaijan. Then, in 1993, the UN Security Council issued four resolutions, 822, 853, 874, and 884, condemning Armenian occupational forces and demanding their withdrawal from legally recognized Azerbaijani territory, the Nagorno-Karabakh. I want to bring to your attention this famous speech by Madeleine Albright at UN Security Council where she is stating these resolutions. You can watch it and we'll come back. And an immediate, complete, and unconditional withdrawal of occupying forces from the area of Fizuli and from the districts of Kelbajar and Agdam and other recently occupied areas of the Azerbaijani Republic. The Council reaffirms the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Azerbaijani Republic and of all other states in the region and the inviolability of their borders. I've heard people say the arguments that UN is just an organization, it's just a puppet in the hands of politicians and political pressures. But 1993, mind you, this is Azerbaijan just gaining its independence from the Soviet Union. It had very little recognition as a country, let alone have any influence or power to pressure United Nations. This argument stands no chance. UN issued those resolutions in 1993 condemning the actions of Armenian occupational forces and it has done so again in 2008. For 30 years, Azerbaijan has been conducting peaceful negotiations with Armenia with the promise that the seized territories will be given back to Azerbaijan. 
This spring, the Armenian PM, Nikol Pashinyan, made a statement claiming that Nagorno-Karabakh belonged to Armenia. Therefore, A, denying the legitimacy of the four UN resolutions and grossly violating them, and B, destroying the progress that was made throughout those peaceful negotiations in 30 years, where the premise was the acknowledgement that Nagorno-Karabakh belonged to Azerbaijan and that it will be gradually but fully returned to Azerbaijan. And by the way, about the name Karabakh, Karabakh from Azerbaijani translates as a black garden. Kara means black and Bakh means garden. This is because the Nagorno-Karabakh region is covered in forests. One might ask, how can a land that was historically an Armenian land be called a Karabakh? If you look at all the documents from history, if you listen how international media refers to that region, they call it Karabakh. They don't call it Artsakh, like Armenians like to call it. One can see who distorts the facts here. You might naturally ask, but how did Armenian people end up in Karabakh region? To answer your question, I'll take you back in history. In 1828, a Turkmen Chai Treaty was signed between Russia and Iran to conclude the Russia-Persian War. As a result of this treaty, Armenians from Iran and from Ottoman Empire were resettled to Yerevan Gubernia, which is the modern-day Armenia, and to Karabakh province. Exactly this year, in 1828, a Russian painter, Vladimir Dmitrievich Mashkov, makes a painting entitled The Resettlement of Armenians from Iran to Soviet Empire which depicts exactly the resettlement process that was a result of Turkmen Chai Treaty. In 1978, a memorial called Magara is mounted in Karabakh to mark the 150th anniversary of resettlement of Armenians to Nagorno-Karabakh. With an easy calculation, 1978 minus 150, that takes us back to 1828, when the Armenians were resettled to Nagorno-Karabakh. And I want to stress the word resettlement here, which is important. They did not live there, they resettled there from Iran and Ottoman Empire to Karabakh. Furthermore, I want to bring to your attention a map that was accepted and printed by France of Azerbaijani Democratic Republic of 1918. If you look at the map, you'll see that Nagorno-Karabakh is a part of Azerbaijan. In the times of Soviet Union, Armenians and Azerbaijani people lived side by side peacefully, and not only in Nagorno-Karabakh, but also across Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is well known for its multiculturalism and tolerance. Just to compare, in Azerbaijan there are 13 churches and 7 synagogues, whereas in Armenia there is one mosque and one synagogue. Furthermore, to compare, in Azerbaijan, which is a predominantly Muslim country, there are 310,000 Christians and 16,000 Jews, whereas in Armenia, there are only 800 Muslims and 100 Jews. Armenians sometimes try to label this ongoing conflict as a religious war, but this is such a lie. Then how do you explain the fact that Israel and Georgia, a predominantly Christian country, is on the side of Azerbaijan, whereas Iran a Muslim country is supporting Armenia. Nagorno-Karabakh is not a religious war. Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is the conflict to regain what justly and legally belongs to Azerbaijan. It's a war to bring back the homeland of over 500,000 internally displaced Azerbaijanis that have been living for 30 years like refugees. Armenians want to portray Azerbaijan as an aggressor. Speaking of aggression, here is the report by the U.S. State Department on Armenian terrorism and their areas of operation. You won't find such a report for Azerbaijan. And it's interesting because Armenia is just as small as Maryland and with about a population of 2 million people and they have such a strong report on terrorism. Whereas Azerbaijan, a country that's much larger in its population, about 10 million people and much larger in its territory, with the size of Texas, doesn't have a report for terrorism. Why? Because we're not aggressors. Because we have never historically been aggressors or violent as a nation. In fact, Azerbaijan prides itself in its tolerance, and diversity is our power. 
An interesting fact I want to share you from history. When Jewish people were persecuted in the Persian Empire and in Europe in early 20th century, Azerbaijan became a safe place for Jewish people to settle down and to live here while maintaining their cultural and their religious identity. The Azerbaijani and Jewish friendly relations today is built on a century-long peaceful coexistence of Azerbaijani and Jewish people here in Azerbaijan. Speaking of aggression, the Khojali massacre committed by Armenians against Azerbaijani people made it to the front covers of New York Times in 1992. You can see more articles from the same year by other news outlets such as The Independent, The Times and European News that show the horrific killing of Azerbaijani people by Armenians. Today, Armenia keeps firing ballistic missiles, including banned cluster missiles on civilian cities in Azerbaijan. They have been killing and injuring hundreds of Azerbaijani innocent people, including little children. Yes, Azerbaijan is having a war with Armenia, and yes, it's carrying out military attacks in Nagorno-Karabakh. But Nagorno-Karabakh is legally an Azerbaijani territory, so we are fighting on our lands whereas Armenia is firing civilian cities in Azerbaijan. That is not a just war. So why is Nagorno-Karabakh so dear to Azerbaijan? First, it's 20% of Azerbaijani territory. Second, it's the homeland of over 500,000 internally displaced people that have been yearning to go back to their homeland and have been living with that pain for 30 years. And third, Karabakh is a culturally and historically a valuable land of Azerbaijani poets, writers, musicians, carpenters, and legendary people of Karabakh. You know it takes centuries for a culture to be born. Karabakh is known for its legendary people like Khushad Bani Natavan, a poetess, for Bulbul, a folk and opera singer, for Uzair Hajibayev, the composer, the man who has written the first opera in Middle East called Leili and Majnun. The town of Shusha in Karabakh is known for its beautiful music genre called Muram. In fact, only Azerbaijani people from that region have a distinct vocal timbre that allow them to sing Mugam. <laughs> In 2003, UNESCO recognized Mugam as a masterpiece of oral and intangible cultural heritage and humanity. Can Armenians list any of their famous Mugam singers, poets, writers, composers from Karabakh if they claim to have been there for centuries? No, because it takes at least a century and more to form such a rich cultural heritage. More so, it takes years and years to practice the art of carpentry and to deliver the masterpieces like Karabakh carpets, which were added to UNESCO's representative masterpiece of intangible heritage as a part of Azerbaijani carpets. One might create falsified evidence or information in a matter of seconds today, given the technology that we have and the photo show we have. But thank God we cannot create an entire culture in a matter of seconds. Thank God we cannot give birth to legendary poets, writers, composers, and a lot of talented people in a matter of years or just days. It takes centuries to form such a strong cultural heritage. Karabakh has been the bedrock of Azerbaijani culture and forever be Azerbaijan. The war for Karabakh is not a political war. It's not a religious war. It's a war to free occupied Azerbaijani lands. It is to return to Azerbaijan what legitimately belongs to it. We have been patiently waiting for 30 years. A whole generation was brought up with the pain in their hearts of never being able to see their homeland. 
We have run out of patience and we want justice. I am from Azerbaijan and Karabakh is my land.